A pernicious lie has been perpetuated on humanity since the Garden of Eden when the serpent, by the way, his name is he in Hebrew is really the shining one. Now, that's a whole sermon in and of itself, isn't it? How the shining one can tempt us. But when he tempted Eve by saying, you'll be like God. And since that time, every generation has repeated that concept in every culture. To be like God. William Henley in his poem Invictus, he put it this way, I am the master of my fate, the captain of my soul. Uh, Frank Sinatra made a lot of money in the last century by singing, I did it my way. That's a pernicious lie because there are only two possibilities for all of humanity, whether you were born 5,000 years ago or five days ago. And those possibilities are that you're either a slave to sin and Satan or you're a slave to righteousness and to God. It's one or the other. And we're all under that possibility. Now, you may say, I didn't have anything to do with being a slave to sin. That's right. We didn't vote on it. We didn't take a survey about it. You know, we weren't asked anything about it, but that's the human condition. And so every one of us is dealing with that. And so the title of the message today is, Whose Slave Am I? And as we go through this, I want you to be looking at your own life and assessing, Whose Slave Am I? Where am I committed in this spiritual journey? We're coming to the end of Romans 6. And this is the chapter to understand if you're trying to figure out this thing called Christian liberty. What's it mean to be a Christian? Remember, it's justification by faith, but under that justification, there's sanctification, the living of the Christian life. And that's what Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 6. As an evangelical pastor, I sense that there's an identity crisis in the evangelical church because of the legalism that we've had in the last century. We're not certain what a Christian should do or can do or what. But Romans 6 gives us insight into that process. So let's look at verses 15 to 23 today, and we're going to begin with verse 15. And this is a caution about humanity's slavery. Paul writes, what shall we say, that, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Now that sounds familiar, doesn't it? It's, as Yogi Berra would say, deja vu all over again. Because back in verse 1 of chapter 6, he raised the same question. In verse 1, the issue was, can you continue in the same lifestyle that you experienced before you became a Christian? Now, for, that's particularly for adults, essentially, isn't it? I mean, if you've uh, had a, a difficult life and, and there's no question that you shouldn't be living that kind of life, maybe you're in uh, prostitution or drugs or, or killings or whatever, you can't continue in that life. But here in verse 16, Paul is saying something else because he goes on, notice what he adds. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to, be, to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. Now Paul is telling us we cannot continue in that kind of a lifestyle, but we can make some choices to be a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. Now a couple observations about this passage before us. When Paul says, don't you know, in the New Testament there are eight different Greek words translated no. Obviously the most frequent one is the word gnosko, which means to know by learning, to know by experience. I mean, we've all experienced that. We've gone to school. Many of us have gone maybe 12 years or some longer, but you learn that way. But also the University of Hard Knocks, right? And, and we all pay tuition to that. Some of us really pay tuition to that. And I know that in this chapter of my life, as I go to areas where there are a lot of retired people, you know, like in Palm Springs, Bob Hope used to say that Palm Springs is the only place where the average temperature and average age are the same. 90. <laughs> but you see these signs, too soon old, too late smart. Now, those of you who are under, under 65, don't smirk or laugh and think those old fuddy-duddies, because if you live long enough, you're going to be there 
and you're going to realize you're too soon old, too late smart, the university of hard knocks. That's one way to learn. But that's not the word Paul uses. He uses the word to see. You've, you've, you've heard somebody, or you've, you've said this yourself, oh, I see what you mean. Or the light goes on, right? The light, you see it. Now, it's understandable he would use that word for this particular group of people. To whom was he writing? He was writing to the Christians at Rome. Now, Rome in that day was the power, the superpower of the world. Wherever Rome went, whether it be a small tribe of people or a huge nation of people, whenever they would conquer, they made them slaves. And Roman citizenship was a special prize. I mean, Paul was privileged to have had his Roman citizenship, and he played that card a couple times in his life. But Paul is saying, you Romans of all people should under, you should see what this means to be a slave. Now there have been slavery throughout human history. It's, it's a different tone today. Mainly it's sex slave trade. We found in, in China where for years they practiced one child policy that now they have a, a lot of men. Uh, one figure I heard a few years ago was 20 million men who can't find a Chinese woman. Why? Because they aborted all the, all the females. That, so now they're struggling. So there's a sex trade going on. So there's still slavery. But here Paul is saying, you Romans should grasp this because you understand slavery. Now, what does a slave do? Summing it all up, bottom line, whatever, a slave must obey his or her master. It's that simple, isn't it? If you do not obey your master, you pay the penalty. It can be very mild, can to death, whatever. But you have to be obedient. And Paul says, here's the choice. You're either a slave to sin and Satan, or you're a slave to righteousness and to God. And you make that choice. Now you may be sitting here and say, Pastor Dave, I'm not a slave to anything. I'm not a drug dealer. I'm not a killer and all that. But just because you're a human being, you and I are slave to, to Satan and to sin because of our humanity. And the main characteristic of that humanity is pride and self-centeredness, isn't it? We all struggle with that. Even after becoming a Christian, we struggle with self-centeredness, don't we? And pride. After one of the services, somebody came up to me and said, you know, they experienced something where a young Christian they became very proud about it. And it put him into a depression for three years because of that. And he had been a, a, a veteran in Vietnam. And he said that was worse than Vietnam. But self-centeredness and pride can be a problem. Now, what we need to understand, Sir Walter Scott put it this way in that poem when he wrote, Oh, what a tangled web we weave, when what? We first we practice to deceive. And that's what happens if you're a slave to sin. It becomes a tangled web. You know, somebody did a study on when you tell a white lie, you have to tell 42 white lies to cover up your you-know-what, right? You, you tell a little white lie and it comes back and bites you big time, doesn't it? It's a tangled web. That's what happens when we become a slave to sin and to Satan. Now, in these verses, there are a couple of principles. When you study your Bible, you need to do observation. What does it say? Interpretation. What does it mean? Application. How does it apply? And then you look for principles, especially if you do teaching of the Bible. What are the principles, these timeless truths? One of the problems in the Old Testament we have is some people will read the Old Testament, and the Old Testament says, do not do this, and they bring it into the 21st century, and it's... It's not a principle, it's, try, it's making a legalistic thing out of it instead of bringing it up to the level of a principle and bringing it across. That's always a challenge. There are two principles in these two verses before us that I want to remind you about. First of all, every Christian should, not, should avoid even one isolated act of sin. Now, I'll work that out later. Don't argue with me. I know I'm not saying you should be perfect, should never sin again, but we need to be aware of the seriousness of even one act of sin. 
to illustrate. King David of Israel, when, uh, and the, the, the text is very clear, when in the spring when his army was going out to do battle, he stayed behind. And the text is very clear. He should have gone out as the king leading the army, but he didn't. And what happened? He was up on the rooftop, saw this beautiful woman bathing. He sent his servants to get her, brought her to him, and they committed adultery, and she became pregnant out of wedlock, and then they deceived and covered up and had her husband killed, and even the baby died. And then it came back through his own son, Absalom. You see how tangled that gets? We should avoid even one isolated act of sin. It's serious stuff, is what I'm saying. And we need to be a cognizant of that. Another one. Um, every Christian should be a willing slave to righteousness. Paul writes, whether you're a slave to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. How do you become a slave to righteousness? Well, the text tells us. By being obedient to the word of God. It's very simple. The man uh, God used to in C.S. Lewis's conversion was George MacDonald. And George wrote this, instead of asking yourself whether you believe or not, which many times we do, we, we focus on believing, ask yourself whether you have this day done one thing because God said it. Whether it's in his word or maybe here in the sermon today, the Spirit of God speaks to you and says, this time you did some business on this thing. Are you obedient to that? To one act? Now let me unpack this, because this is really important. This is how to be a slave to righteousness. Let's say you're reading in the Sermon on the Mount. Good place to read, isn't it? And you're reading along, and all of a sudden, three times Jesus says to you, do not worry about tomorrow. Three times. Now if I say it three times, or your parents say it three times, maybe you can blow that off. But when our Lord says it three times, do not worry about a thing. And yet, how many of us have been worrying about th something this past week? Maybe it's our health. Maybe it's our marriage. Maybe it's our children. Maybe it's our parents. Maybe it's our grandchildren. Maybe it's the presidential election here in the United States. Whatever. Jesus says, do not worry. And so when you and I are worrying, we're not a slave to righteousness. We're being a slave to sin. Because it's not, we're not trusting and being obedient to what the word tells us. Another one, because this is so important. This is, this is where the word is so practical. In Ephesians 5, Paul writes, and, and this is from the a paraphrase by J.B. Phillips. Don't get your stimulus from wine, for there's always a danger of excessive drinking. But let the Spirit stimulate your souls. Now this text is not a temperance text. I say that because there's a contemporary expositor. I, I admire him. He's a great teacher of the Bible. But in his sermons on Ephesians, he really blew it, I think, in this. He, he makes this a temperance text. This has nothing to do with temperance. The more important picture is the influence of the Spirit. The King James says, the filling of the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. And that filling is not a one-time thing. You know, a dramatic experience where you have some kind of emotional thing or some, something happens to you and you think, well, I'm filled with the Spirit. No, it's a, you have to keep on being filled with the Spirit. My patron saint, uh, Ray Stedman, uh, his book, Authentic Christianity, by the way, is on this. It, it doesn't say it in the text. But when, you, when you've read it enough, as I have, I've probably read it 40 times now since I first read it, that you see it's teaching how to be filled with the Spirit. And Ray, I heard him say one time that 85% of evangelical Christians do not understand how to be filled with the Spirit. Wow. Let's say there are 200 people in this room. That means that only 30 of us, right, 15%, only 30 of us in this room understand this. No wonder there are problems in churches, right? No wonder there are problems in marriage. The filling of the Spirit is the secret to a successful marriage. It has nothing to do with a satisfying sex life. has nothing to do with having enough money to meet all the bills. has nothing to do with communication. 
It's the filling of the Spirit. The filling of the Spirit is successful in our parenting, Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. The filling of the Spirit is, is, makes us successful in our marketplace, what our business, our work, our school is, Ephesians 6, 5 through 9. You see how important that is? And yet, when you and I just read past that, and we don't see, oh, we get ticked off at our spouse, instead of saying, you know, I need to be filled with the Spirit, and God will help you. He will. Friday, Marilyn and I were walking across the parking lot in Costco in La Quinta, and we were walking, walking along, we were holding hands, and somebody behind said, well, I haven't seen that in a long time. And I thought, well, maybe it's somebody I know from our neighborhood, or I, I used to pastor, I was involved in a church there. Uh, maybe, maybe we know them. Looked around and didn't know them a bit. Some couple, and, and, and they started, you know, making, hey, we, didn't, we don't see that very often. And they were bantering back and forth, and I could tell they were having a little tension themselves. Well, they went on ahead of us, and when we started to walk into Costco, she came up to us and says, how long have you guys been married? We said, 50 years. Well, w the only way we succeeded there, and I hope my wife's not listening to this. You aren't listening to this, Marilyn. The only way we've endured marriage is the filling of the Spirit, believe me. But you see how important it is to be obedient to the Word of God. And take the, whenever you approach anything and, and the Spirit says, listen up, this is what you need to pay attention to, that's being a slave to righteousness, to obey the Word of God when it touches your life. Now, Paul goes on and Here's where you get a change from being a slave to sin to a slave to righteousness in verses 17 and 18. And these are so incredible, these verses. If you're wondering about your own spiritual journey, am I going to go to heaven when I die? Or what does it take to get to heaven? Or how can I know I'm going to heaven when I die? Draw circles around this or arrows or I put smiley faces or frowny faces or stars or exclamation points or whatever in my study Bibles. Just highlight these two verses because this is the essence of what conversion is. You want to know what does it take to be a Christian? Here it is. Notice what Paul says, but thanks be to God. Hallelujah. I mean, I don't want to be a slave to sin and I'm sure you don't either. Thanks be to God we can move from that kingdom into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of righteousness. Thanks be to God for that. Paul says, and here it is. This, is, this is the sentence to highlight. You wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. Salvation to be a thoroughgoing conversion and not what, by the way, this, you want to, might put a, uh, a verse to compare is Hebrews 6 about possibility of losing one's salvation. If you understand this verse, you understand that verse. But Paul says here, there are three things that have to be involved in one's conversion. First of all, you wholeheartedly are emotions. Salvation is an emotional experience. That's why the angels rejoice in heaven when one person repents and becomes part of the forever family of God. It is emotional. Now, the challenge is most of us, like myself, all, everyone in my family, I mean, I'm talking about my nuclear family, myself, Marilyn, and our two daughters all came to Christ at ages, our two daughters at five and six, and I was nine, and Marilyn was 11. Uh, we were children, so, you know, we didn't know what we were being saved from, whereas somebody who's an adult and really blown life, and they've really screwed up relationships, and they're hitting the wall, there's tremendous emotion. But there is emotion in that. And then Paul says, you wholeheartedly obeyed. Now, obedience is an act of the will, isn't it? Remember, Jesus said, you will not come to me, that you might have life. Now, if I've learned anything in 50 years of pastoring, that it's a will. One of the hardest things for all of us in ministry is to recruit people. I mean, there's never enough people who volunteering to do the positions. If you think every position in this church is filled just because we have a lot of bodies, it's not so. There's always a need for volunteers. But recruiting people is hard. But I've learned when people say, I try to recruit, and they say, Pastor, I can't do that. It's not that they can't. They don't want to. It's an act of the will. If you want to do something, you'll move heaven and hell to do it, won't you? 
Let's say this afternoon you go home and something you've been dreaming about all your life, whatever it is, you can fill in the blank. And you get a text or you get an email or you get a certified letter or you get a letter or a phone call or somebody comes to your door and knock, knock, knock and you've won this. You can do this thing. But by, the, by this Friday, coming Friday, you have to have everything done for the next three weeks at your, in your work, whatever that is. Now, if your boss would come to you and say that without that reward, you'd grouse for six months, wouldn't you? Yeah, that slave driver, so-and-so is no good. What's he want? You know, what's he trying to do? But because you want to do it, you'll get that done. You'll probably have it done by Wednesday because you really want to do it. And it's where we choose to be obedient, the things we want to do. And so we embrace this truth that we wholeheartedly obey. We choose that we're going to embrace what it means to be a Christian. And we're doing it, notice what Paul goes on to say, the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. Our minds. Your mind has to be involved in this. Now I believe a child, as I said, our daughters came to Christ that made a profession of faith at six years of age. And I believe that's sincere and it's happened, but as they grow, it develops. Their, their emotions become greater, their, their will is more committed to it, and their mind is based on, if it's a truthful conversion, if it's based on facts. That's why the Bible is so important as our authority. It's not a bunch of myths and fairy tales. I still remember that rabbi in the University of Iowa he was castigating and, and criticizing and, and ridiculing the, the Protestant mainline pastors who were in this, it was a religious meeting at the University of Iowa School of Religion. And he said, you guys say my, my history is a bunch of fairy tales. He said, no, Moses was real. Adam and Eve were real. Those people were real. That's my history. Well, you and I can update. The New Testament is our history. Jesus lived. He's not a figment of one's imagination. You can't go through the Gospels and throw out this and that because you don't agree with it or you don't think it's real. It's a bunch of baloney. It's history. It's truth. And it's the truth that sets us free. Now, you don't need to know the whole Bible from Genesis through the maps. You don't need to know all of that. You just need to know the essence of what it means. You're a sinner and Christ died for your sin and God's given you the gift of eternal life. And you need to repent. It's very simple. I mean, there are things in the Bible I've studied over 50 years I do not understand. You know, we were singing a song earlier about these bones will sing. It reminds me of those crazy bones in Ezekiel. I haven't figured them out yet. I'm still trying to figure out what's he mean by those. Whose bones are them bones? But you don't have to know it all. But it's based on truth. But that's the essence of conversion. Our mind, our will, and our emotions are engaged. Now, a couple of conclusions we make out of this passage. Salvation is not an emotional fire escape from hell. Now, I don't know anybody in his or her right mind who really understood what hell is all about wants to go there. I mean, the way Jesus described it, no way. I don't want anything to do with that kind of experience. But it's not just an, an escape from that. You know, I've met people who say, I just want to know I'm going to heaven, but don't talk to me about church. <laughs> Hello? I was talking with somebody earlier in first service. In, it seems to be a wave coming from Europe. And, and by the way, I heard it the other day in the Banning Starbuck when we were going through there. It's this statement. Shut up. Have you ever heard that? Somebody say, shut up. Instead of whatever, it's shut up. What are you talking about? Shut up. Nobody wants to go to hell. And you can't just embrace salvation and not be part of the family of God and be involved in that. So it's not that. But the second conclusion out of these verses, every Christian, every Christian should be a willing slave to righteousness. You should be, when you're reading the Word of God, when you're being exposed to the teaching of the Word of God, whether it's here or in a small group or some other venue, <clears throat> you should be a slave. To, when the Spirit says, listen up, this is a blind spot in you, this is where you're weak, you need to shore this up in your life, you should be willing to do that. 
The songwriter put it this way, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. That's what it means to be a slave to righteousness. Now, if you're not convinced yet, Paul goes on in verses 19 through 23 and so shows us the consequences of human, humanity's slavery. Verse 19, I will put this in human terms because you're weak in your natural selves just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer them in slavery to righteousness, leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. Now here, this verse is to Christians, not just to the unsaved. For the wages of sin is death. Now that's so important, I want to back the truck up and come and buy that again. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord couple observations. Being a slave to sin is a downward spiral. It gets ever, ever increasing to wickedness. Anyone who studied any kind of addiction, no matter what it is, it gets worse and worse, doesn't it? Nobody ever started out to be addicted to this drug, or addicted to this alcohol, or addicted to that, or addicted to pornography, or addicted to sexual immorality. Nobody ever started out that way. But it just gets worse and worse and worse. And notice it leads to death. In some cases, literal death, isn't it? Drug overdose, destroy your liver on alcohol or something else. Physical death. But for the Christian, remember I said this is to the Christian. For the Christian who even gives in to that, it's spiritual death. Paul said it there. Uh, let's see. The things you were ashamed of. You know it when you do it, and you're ashamed to come to God. You begin to ignore feeding your soul with the Word of God. You begin to skip church because you have guilt and struggle, and you wonder where God is. You're alienated from God. You're depressed and discouraged. That's the result of this. But slavery to righteousness is an upward spiral. Notice that. Now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. Two ideas here. Holiness. That's a good word. Now, you may think of somebody, you know, if you've, if you've been brainwashed by Saturday Night Live or some of the movies or some of the books that are out on the market about Christians, that a holy person is a, a sad sack, a, you know, an anachronism. They, you know, they, they belong back in the 17th century instead of the 21st century and all of that stuff. But holiness is a beautiful word. Bill, I think, in this service mentioned the beauty of his holiness. There's a beauty to that. It means whole. Your humanity as God intended you to be. That's what it happens when you're a slave to righteousness. But not only that, it leads to eternal life. Now, eternal life is not just in the sweet by and by. If you think of that, you're missing the, the meaning and the, the, the implications of this word. Jesus helped us to understand it in the high priestly, that should only be tried by a professional, in that high priestly prayer, <laughs> in his high priestly prayer. Remember what he said? And this is life eternal. What? that they may know thee. You see, eternity invades time and space anytime, whenever you and I experience the reality of God's presence in our lives. It might be at a, a mountaintop experience. It might be in a church service. It might be as it was for me out on a, a football field in eastern Pennsylvania. Wherever you encounter the reality of God and experience God, like Henry Blackaby in his great book, Experiencing God, talks about we can experience God. God wants us to have that experience, not just once or twice, but throughout our spiritual journey. But that's eternal life. That's connecting 
with God in the midst of it. You see, that's what God wants in all of us. He wants you and me not to be a slave to sin. It's so easy. But he wants you and me to be a slave to righteousness, to be obedient when the Word of God says, you know, your marriage is in a mess and you need to straighten it out by being filled with the Spirit and by being loving. When the Spirit speaks to you about something, respond. So as we wrap it up, uh, I said every Christian should avoid an isolated act of sin, and I want to come back to that because I'm not talking about none of us can be perfect. I mean, I've sinned, I will, and you know, if, if Jesus doesn't come or I don't die soon, I'm going to sin again, I know. That's part of the human condition. It's not that you want to, but our flesh and our weakness and all that. But we should, avo we should take sin seriously is the point. Let me come back to David. If you want to read the biography of David, it's Second Samuel. It's a real easy book to outline. The first ten chapters are David's triumphs. David was the golden boy of Israel. I mean, he was on a fast track to be king. He killed Goliath. He killed the lions. He killed the bear. Everything he did, he had the Midas touch. But then chapter 11 was a pivotal point. When he saw Bathsheba, and he gave in to the flesh, and he committed, committed that act of sin that became a tangled web. And the rest of 2 Samuel, 12 through 24, is David's tragedies. The unraveling of his life. The unraveling of the kingship. The things he had to put up. His own son rebelling against him and, and embarrassing him. That's what happens. Another one. Moses. Moses had an anger problem. I had an anger problem. I know pastors have anger problems. Missionaries have anger problems. I've had chairman of the boards have anger problems. I've had lay people have anger problems. Three times Moses had an anger problem. The first time when he was 40 and he killed the Egyptian and ended up being a fugitive from justice for 40 years. Then God recalled him at the burning bush and sent him back and, and he went and led the people out of, out of Egypt and went up in the mountain, spent 40 days with God. Came down, the people were committing idolatry. He blew it in anger. He broke the tablets. Then about 38 years later, and he, as he's leading the children of Israel and getting ready to get ready, to get ready for the promised land, God said to Moses, now I want you to speak to the rock. And what did Moses do? He was angry and he struck the rock. And God said, that's it. I'm warning you, if you have an anger problem, you better take this seriously. It kept Moses from the promised land, and it'll keep you from the promised land as well. Now, I don't know if your problem is sexual immorality, as it was with David. That might be not handling your sexuality properly. You might be hooked on the internet with pornography. You might be heterosexual immorality or homosexual immorality. Or it might be anger. Or it might be another attitude. But take it seriously is the point I'm making. And there's hope. I wouldn't be a pastor if I didn't believe there's hope. There's always hope. God will meet you. You may need a pastor or someone you trust or by yourself. I've, God's helped me through a lot of them by myself. And I've had to seek out a, an accountability partner for other things. But God will help you through that. There's no temptation taking you. But such is common to man. But if you look around, God will provide a way out. So take every sin seriously. You see, Romans 6 tells us that every one of us is either a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. Whose slave are you today? Let's pray together. Almighty God, we come to you and thank you that for the practical teaching of uh, Romans 6, and, and I pray for any of us here today who may be struggling with uh, sinful acts that man has been a habit for years. Just, I pray God for grace and deliverance. I pray that you would help each of us to be obedient to what your spirit is saying to this audience. I know to each of us, God, your spirit is speaking. Your spirit is convicting. Your spirit is wooing. Your spirit is, is tugging at our heart, rapping on our mind. I pray, God, that 
we would be responsive to that in the closing moments today. In Jesus' name, amen.